Chapter Two of Lady Barbarina by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was Lady Marmaduke, wife of Sir Henry of that clan, who had introduced the amusing young American to Lady Betjeman. After which, Lady Betjeman had made him acquainted with her mother and sisters. Lady Marmaduke too was of outland strain remaining for her conjugal baronet the most ponderable consequence of a tour in the united states at present by the end of ten years she knew her london as she had never known her new york so that it had been easy for her to be as she called herself jackson's social godmother she had views with regard to his career and these views fitted into a scheme of high policy which, if our space permitted, I would be glad to lay before the reader in its magnitude. She wished to add an arch or two to the bridge on which she had effected her transit from America, and it was her belief that Dr. Lemon might furnish the materials. This bridge, as yet a somewhat sketchy and rickety structure, she saw, in the future, boldly stretch from one solid pier to another. It could but serve both ways, for reciprocity was the keynote of Lady Marmaduke's plan. It was her belief that an ultimate fusion was inevitable, and that those who were the first to understand the situation would enjoy the biggest returns from it. The first time the young man had dined with her, he met Lady Betjeman, who was her intimate friend. Lady Betjeman was remarkably gracious, asking him to come and see her as if she really meant it. He, in fact, presented himself, and in her drawing-room met her mother, who happened to be calling at the same moment. Lady Canterville, not less friendly than her daughter, invited him down to Pasterns for Eastertide, and before a month had passed it struck him that though he was not what he would have called intimate at any house in London, the door of the house of Clement opened to him pretty often. This seemed no small good fortune, for it always opened upon a charming picture. The inmates were a blooming and beautiful race, and their interior had an aspect of the ripest comfort. It was not the splendour of New York, as New York had lately begun to appear to the young man, but an appearance and a set of conditions, of factors, as he used to say, not to be set in motion in that city by any power of purchase. He himself had a great deal of money, and money was good even when it was new but old money was somehow more to the shilling and the pound. Even after he learned that Lord Canterville's fortune was less present than past, it was still the positive golden glow that struck him. It was Lady Betjeman who had told him her father wasn't rich, having told him furthermore many surprising things, things both surprising in themselves and surprising on her lips. This was to come home to him afresh that evening, the day he met Sidney Feeder in the park. He dined out in the company of Lady Betjeman, and afterwards, as she was alone, her husband had gone down to listen to a debate, she offered to take him on. She was going to several places, at some of which he must be due. They compared notes, and it was settled they should proceed together to the Trumpingtons, whither, it appeared, at eleven o'clock, all the world was proceeding, with the approach to the house choked for half a mile with carriages. It was a close, muggy night. Lady Betjeman's chariot, in its place in the rank, stood still for long periods. In his corner beside her, through the open window, Jackson Lemon, rather hot, rather oppressed, looked out on the moist, greasy pavement, over which was flung, a considerable distance up and down, the flare of a public-house. Lady Betjeman, however, was not impatient, for she had a purpose in her mind, and now she could say what she wished. Do you really love her? That was the first thing she said. Well, I guess so, Jackson Lemon answered, as if he didn't recognize the obligation to be serious. She looked at him a moment in silence. He felt her gaze, and turning his eyes, saw her face, partly shadowed, with the aid of a street lamp. She was not so pretty as Lady Barb. Her features had a certain sharpness. Her hair, very light in color, and wonderfully frizzled, almost covered her eyes, the expression of which, however, together with that of her pointed nose and the glitter of several diamonds, emerged from the gloom. What she next said seemed somehow to fall in with that. "'You don't seem to know. I never saw a man in so vague a state.' "'You push me a little too much. I must have time to think of it,' the young man returned. 
You know, in my country they allow us plenty of time. He had several little oddities of expression, of which he was perfectly conscious, and which he found convenient, for they guarded him in a society condemning a lonely New Yorker, who proceeded by native inspiration to much exposure. They ensured him the profit corresponding with sundry sacrifices. He had no great assortment of vernacular drolleries, conscious or unconscious, to draw upon, but the occasional use of one, discreetly chosen, made him appear simpler than he really was, and reasons determined his desiring this result. He was not simple, he was subtle, circumspect, shrewd, perfectly aware that he might make mistakes. There was the danger of his making one now, a mistake that might gravely count. He was resolved only to succeed. It is true that for a great success he would take a certain risk, but the risk was to be considered, and he gained time while he multiplied his guesses and talked about his country. "'You may take ten years, if you like,' said Lady Betjamin. "'I'm in no hurry whatever to make you my brother-in-law. Only you must remember that you spoke to me first. "'What did I say?' "'You spoke to me of Barb as the finest girl you had seen in England.' Oh, I'm willing to stand by that. And he had another try, which would have been transparent to a compatriot. I guess I like her type. I should think you might. I like her all round, with all her peculiarities. What do you mean by her peculiarities? Well, she has some peculiar ideas, said Jackson Lemon, in a tone of the sweetest reasonableness, and she has a peculiar way of speaking. "'Ah, you can't expect us to speak so well as you,' cried Lady Betjamin. "'I don't see why not.' He was perfectly candid. "'You do some things much better.' "'We've our own ways at any rate, and we think them the best in the world, as they mostly are,' laughed Lady Betjamin. "'One of them is not to let a gentleman devote himself to a girl for so long a time without some sense of responsibility. If you don't wish to marry my sister, you ought to go away.' "'I ought never to have come,' said Jackson Lemon. "'I can scarcely agree to that,' her ladyship good-naturedly replied, "'as in that case I should have lost the pleasure of knowing you. "'It would have spared you this duty, which you dislike very much. "'Asking you about your intentions? "'Oh, I don't dislike it at all,' she cried. "'It amuses me extremely.' "'Should you like your sister to marry me?' asked Jackson with great simplicity. If he expected to take her by surprise, he was disappointed. She was perfectly prepared to commit herself. I should like it particularly. I think English and American society ought to be but one. I mean the best of each. A great whole. Will you allow me to ask whether Lady Marmaduke suggested that to you? He at once inquired. We've often talked of it. Oh, yes, that's her aim. Well, it's my aim, too. I think there's a lot to be done. And you'd like me to do it? Uh, to begin it, precisely. Don't you think we ought to see more of each other? I mean, she took the precaution to explain, just the best in each country. Jackson Lemon appeared to weigh it. I'm afraid I haven't any general ideas. If I should marry an English girl, it wouldn't be for the good of the species. Well, we want to be mixed a little, that I'm sure of, Lady Betjamin said. "'You certainly got that from Lady Marmaduke,' he commented. "'It's too tiresome. You're not consenting to be serious. But my father will make you so,' she went on with her pleasant assurance. "'I may as well let you know that he intends in a day or two to ask you your intentions. That's all I wish to say to you. I think you ought to be prepared.' "'I'm much obliged to you. Lord Canterville will do quite right,' the young man allowed." There was to his companion something really unfathomable in this little American doctor whom she had taken up on grounds of large policy, and who, though he was assumed to have sunk the medical character, was neither handsome nor distinguished, but only immensely rich and quite original, since he wasn't strictly insignificant. It was unfathomable to begin with that a medical man should be so rich, or that so rich a man should be medical. It was even, to an eye always gratified by suitability, and for that matter, almost everywhere recognizing it, rather irritating. 
Jackson Lemon himself could have explained the anomaly better than any one else, but this was an explanation one could scarcely ask for. There were other things, his cool acceptance of certain situations, his general indisposition to make comprehension easy, let alone to guess it, with all his guessing so much hindered, his way of taking refuge in jokes which at times had not even the merit of being American, his way, too, of appearing to be a suitor without being an aspirant. Lady Betjeman, however, was, like her puzzling friend himself, prepared to run a certain risk. His reserves made him slippery, but that was only when one pressed. She flattered herself she could handle people lightly. "'My father will be sure to act with perfect tact,' she said, though, of course, if you shouldn't care to be questioned, you can go out of town." She had the air of really wishing to act with the most natural delicacy. "'I don't want to go out of town. I'm enjoying it far too much here,' Jackson cried. "'And wouldn't your father have a right to ask me what I should mean by that?' Lady Betjeman thought. She really wondered. But in a moment she exclaimed, "'He's incapable of saying anything vulgar.' She hadn't definitely answered his inquiry, and he was conscious of this, but he was quite ready to say to her a little later, as he guided her steps from the brougham to the strip of carpet, which, beneath a rickety border of striped cloth, and between a double row of waiting footmen, policemen, and dingy amateurs of both sexes, stretched from the curbstone to the portal of the Trumpingtons. Of course I shan't wait for Lord Canterville to speak to me. He had been expecting some such announcement as this from Lady Betjeman, and really judged her father would do no more than his duty. He felt he should be prepared with an answer to the high challenge so prefigured, and he wondered at himself for still not having come to the point. Sidney Feeder's question in the park had made him feel rather pointless. It was the first direct allusion as yet made to his possible marriage by any one but Lady Betjeman. None of his own people were in London. He was perfectly independent, and even if his mother had been within reach, he couldn't quite have consulted her on the subject. He loved her dearly, better than any one, but she wasn't a woman to consult, for she approved of whatever he did. The fact of his doing it settled the case for it. He had been careful not to be too serious when he talked with Lady Barb's relative but he was very serious indeed as he thought over the matter within himself, which he did even among the diversions of the next half-hour, while squeezed, obliquely, and with tight arrests, through the crush in the Trumpington's drawing-room. At the end of the half-hour he came away, and at the door he found Lady Betjeman, from whom he had separated on entering the house, and who, this time with a companion of her own sex, was awaiting her carriage and still going on. He gave her his arm to the street, and as she entered the vehicle she repeated that she hoped he'd just go out of town. "'Who, then, would tell me what to do?' he returned, looking at her through the window. She might tell him what to do, but he felt free all the same, and he was determined this should continue. To prove it to himself he jumped into a hansom, and drove back to Brook Street and to his hotel, instead of proceeding to a bright-windowed house in Portland Place, where he knew he should, after midnight, find Lady Canterville and her daughters. He recalled a reference to that chance during his ride with Lady Barb, who would probably expect him, but it made him taste his liberty not to go, and he liked to taste his liberty. He was aware that to taste it in perfection he ought to turn in, but he didn't turn in, he didn't even take off his hat. He walked up and down his sitting-room, with his head surmounted by this ornament, a good deal tipped back, and with his hands in his pockets. There were various cards stuck into the frame of the mirror over his chimney-piece, and every time he passed the place he seemed to see what was written on one of them, the name of the mistress of the house in Portland Place, his own name, and in the lower left-hand corner, a small dance. Of course, now, he must make up his mind. He'd make it up by the next day. That was what he said to himself as he walked up and down. And according to his decision, he'd speak to Lord Canterville, or would take the night express to Paris. It was better, meanwhile, he shouldn't see Lady Barb. It was vivid to him, as he occasionally paused with fevered eyes on the card in the chimney-glass, that he had come pretty far, 
and he had come so far because he was under the spell yes he was under the spell or whatever it was of lady barb there was no doubt whatever of this he had a faculty for diagnosis and he knew perfectly what was the matter with him he wasted no time in musing on the mystery of his state in wondering if he mightn't have escaped such a seizure by a little vigilance at first or if it would abate should he go away he accepted it frankly for the sake of the pleasure it gave him the girl was the delight of most of his senses and confined himself to considering how it would square with his general situation to marry her the squaring wouldn't at all necessarily follow from the fact that he was in love too many other things would come in between the most important of these was the change not only of the geographical but of the social standpoint for his wife and a certain readjustment that it would involve in his own relation to things he wasn't inclined to readjustments and there was no reason why he should be his own position was in most respects so advantageous but the girl tempted him almost irresistibly satisfying his imagination both as a lover and as a student of the human organism she was so blooming so complete of a type so rarely encountered in that degree of perfection jackson lemon was no anglomaniac but he took peculiar pleasure in certain physical facts of the english their complexion their temperament their tissue and lady barb had affected him from the first as in flexible virginal form a wonderful compendium of these elements there was something simple and robust in her beauty it had the quietness of an old greek statue without the vulgarity of the modern simper or of contemporary prettiness her head was antique and though her conversation was quite of the present period jackson told himself that some primitive sincerity of soul couldn't but match with the cast of her brow of her bosom of the back of her neck and with the high carriage of her head which was at once so noble and so easy he saw her as she might be in the future the beautiful mother of beautiful children in whom the appearance of race should be conspicuous he should like his children to have the appearance of race as well as all other signs of good stuff and wasn't unaware that he must take his precautions accordingly a great many people in england had these indications and it was a pleasure to him to see them especially as no one had them so unmistakably as the second daughter of the cantervilles it would be a great luxury to call a creature so constituted one's own nothing could be more evident than that because it made no difference that she wasn't strikingly clever striking cleverness wasn't one of the signs nor a mark of the english complexion in general it was associated with the modern simper which was a result of modern nerves if jackson had wanted a wife all fiddle-strings of course he could have found her at home but this tall fair girl whose character like her figure appeared mainly to have been formed by riding across country was differently put together all the same would it suit his book as they said in london to marry her and transport her to new york he came back to this question came back to it with a persistency which had she been admitted to a view of it would have tried the patience of lady betjamin she had been irritated more than once at his appearing to attach himself so exclusively to that horn of the dilemma as if it could possibly fail to be a good thing for a little american doctor to marry the daughter of an english peer it would have been more becoming in her ladyship's eyes that he should take this for granted a little more and take the consent of her ladyships of their ladyships family a little less they looked at the matter so differently jackson lemon was conscious that if he should propose for the young woman who so strongly appealed to him it would be because it suited him and not because it suited his possible sisters-in-law he believed himself to act in all things by his own faculty of choice and volition a feature of his outfit in which he had the highest confidence it would have seemed indeed that just now this part of his inward machine was not working very regularly since though he had come home to go to bed the stroke of half-past twelve saw him jump not into his sheets but into a hansom which the whistle of the porter had summoned to the door of his hotel and which he rattled off to portland place
Here he found, in a very large house, an assembly of five hundred persons and a band of music concealed in a bower of azaleas. Lady Canterville had not arrived. He wandered through the rooms and assured himself of that. He also discovered a very good conservatory, where there were banks and pyramids of azaleas. He watched the top of the staircase, but it was a long time before he saw what he was looking for, and his impatience grew at last extreme. The reward, however, when it came, was all he could have desired. It consisted of a clear smile from Lady Barb, who stood behind her mother, while the latter extended vague fingertips to the hostess. The entrance of this charming woman and her beautiful daughters, always a noticeable incident, was affected with a certain spread of commotion, and just now it was agreeable to Jackson to feel this produced impression concern him probably more than any one else in the house. Tall, dazzling, indifferent, looking about her as if she saw very little, Lady Barb was certainly a figure round which a young man's fancy might revolve. Very rare, yet very quiet and very simple, she had little manner and little movement, but her detachment was not a vulgar art. She appeared to efface herself, to wait till, in the natural course, she should be attended to, and in this there was evidently no exaggeration, for she was too proud not to have perfect confidence. Her sister, quite another affair, with a little surprised smile, which seemed to say that in her extreme innocence she was still prepared for anything, having heard, indirectly, such extraordinary things about society, was much more impatient and more expressive, and had always projected across the threshold the pretty radiance of her eyes and teeth before her mother's name was announced. Lady Canterville was by many persons more admired and more championed than her daughters. She had kept even more beauty than she had given them, and it was a beauty which had been called intellectual. She had extraordinary sweetness, without any definite professions. Her manner was mild almost to tenderness. There was even in it a degree of thoughtful pity, of human comprehension. Moreover, her features were perfect, and nothing could be more gently gracious than a way she had of speaking, or rather of listening, to people with her head inclined a little to one side. Jackson liked her without trepidation, and she certainly had been awfully nice to him. He approached Lady Barb as soon as he could do so without an appearance of rushing up. He remarked to her that he hoped very much she wouldn't dance. He was a master of the art which flourishes in New York above every other, and had guided her through a dozen waltzes with a skill which, as she felt, left absolutely nothing to be desired. But dancing was not his business to-night. She smiled without scorn at the expression of his hope. "'That's what Mamma has brought us here for,' she said. "'She doesn't like it if we don't dance.' "'How does she know whether she likes it or not? You always have danced.' "'Oh, once there was a place where I didn't,' said Lady Barb. He told her he would at any rate settle it with her mother, and persuaded her to wander with him into the conservatory, where coloured lights were suspended above the plants, and a vault of verdure arched above. In comparison with the other rooms, this retreat was far and strange. But they were not alone. Half a dozen other couples appeared to have had reasons as good as theirs. The gloom, nonetheless, was rosy with the slopes of azalea, and suffused with mitigated music, which made it possible to talk without consideration of one's neighbours. In spite of this, though it was only in looking back on the scene later that Lady Barb noted the fact, these dispersed couples were talking very softly. She didn't look at them. She seemed to take it that virtually she was alone with the young American. She said something about the flowers, about the fragrance of the air. For all answer to which he asked her, as he stood there before her, a question that might have startled her by its suddenness. How do people who marry in England ever know each other before marriage? They have no chance. I'm sure I don't know, she returned. I never was married. It's very different in my country. There a man may see much of a girl, he may freely call on her, he may be constantly alone with her. I wish you allowed that over here. 
Lady Barb began to examine the less ornamental sign of her fan, as if it had never invited her before. "'It must be so very odd, America,' she then concluded. "'Well, I guess in that matter we're right. Over here it's a leap in the dark.' "'I'm sure I don't know,' she again made answer. She had folded her fan. She stretched out her arm mechanically, and plugged a sprig of azalea. "'I guess it doesn't signify at all,' Jackson, however, proceeded. "'Don't you know they say that love's blind at the best?' His keen young face was bent upon hers. His thumbs were in the pockets of his trousers. He smiled with a slight strain, showing his fine teeth. She said nothing only pulling her azalea to pieces. She was usually so quiet that this small movement was striking. "'This is the first time I've seen you in the least without a lot of people,' he went on. "'Yes, it's very tiresome. I've been sick of it. I didn't even want to come to-night.' She hadn't met his eyes, though she knew they were seeking her own. But now she looked at him straight. She had never objected to his appearance and in this respect had no repugnance to surmount. She liked a man to be tall and handsome, and Jackson Lemon was neither, but when she was sixteen, and as tall herself as she was to be at twenty, she had been in love, for three weeks, with one of her cousins, a little fellow in the Hussars, who was shorter even than the American, was of inches markedly fewer than her own. This proved that distinction might be independent of stature, not that she had ever reasoned it out. Dr. Lemon's facial spareness, and his bright ocular attention, which had a fine edge and a marked scale, unfolded and applied rule fashion, affected her as original, and she thought of them as rather formidable to a good many people, which would do very well in the husband of hers. As she made this reflection, it of course never occurred to her that she herself might suffer true measurement for she was not a sacrificial lamb. She felt sure his features expressed a mind, a mind immensely useful, like a good hack or whatever, and that he knew how to employ. She would never have supposed him a doctor, though indeed, when all was said, this was very negative, and didn't account for the way he imposed himself. "'Why, then, did you come?' she asked, in answer to his last speech because it seems to me, after all, better to see you this way than not to see you at all. I want to know you better." "'I don't think I ought to stay here,' she said, as she looked around her. "'Don't go till I've told you I love you,' the young man distinctly replied. She made no exclamation, indulged in no start. He couldn't see even that she changed colour. She took his request with a noble simplicity, her head erect and her eyes lowered. I don't think you've quite a right to tell me that." "'Why not?' Jackson demanded. "'I want to claim the right. I want you to give it to me.' "'I can't. I don't know you. You've said that yourself.' "'Can't you have a little faith?' he at once asked, speaking as fast as if he were not even a little afraid to urge the pace. "'That will help us to know each other better. It's disgusting, the want of opportunity. Even at Pastern's I could scarcely get a walk with you. But I've the most absolute trust of you. I know I love you, and I couldn't do more than that at the end of six months. I love your beauty, I love your nature, I love you from head to foot. Don't move, please don't move." He lowered his tone now, but it went straight to her ear, and we must believe conveyed a certain eloquence. For himself, after he had heard himself say these words, all his being was in a glow. It was a luxury to speak to her of her beauty. It brought him nearer to her than he had ever been. But the colour had come into her face, and seemed to remind him that her beauty wasn't all. "'Everything about you is true and sweet and grand,' he went on. "'Everything's dear to me. I'm sure you're good. I don't know what you think of me. I asked Lady Betjeman to tell me, and she told me to judge for myself. Well, then, I judge you like me. Haven't I a right to assume that till the contrary is proved? May I speak to your father? That's what I want to know. I've been waiting, but now what should I wait for longer? I want to be able to tell him you've given me hope. I suppose I ought to speak to him first. I meant to, to-morrow. But meanwhile, to-night, I thought I'd just put this in. In my country it wouldn't matter particularly. 
You must see all that over there for yourself. If you should tell me not to speak to your father, I wouldn't. I'd wait. But I like better to ask your leave to speak to him than ask his to speak to you. His voice had sunk almost to a whisper, but though it trembled, the fact of his pleading gave it intensity. He had the same attitude, his thumbs in his trousers, his neat attentive young head, his smile, which was a matter of course. No one would have imagined what he was saying. She had listened without moving, and at the end she raised her eyes. They rested on his own a moment, and he remembered for a long time the look, the clear effluence of splendid maidenhood, as deep as a surrender, that passed her lids. Disconcertingly, however, there was no surrender in what she answered. You may say anything you please to my father, but I don't wish to hear any more. You've said too much, considering how little idea you've given me before. I was watching you, said Jackson Lemon. She held her head higher, still looking straight at him. Then, quite seriously, I don't like to be watched, she returned. You shouldn't be so beautiful, then. Won't you give me a word of hope? I've never supposed I should marry a foreigner, said Lady Barb. Do you call me a foreigner? I think your ideas are very different, and your country different. You told me so yourself. I should like to show it to you. I would make you like it. I'm not sure what you'd make me do, she went on very honestly. Nothing you don't want. I'm sure you'd try, she smiled, as for more accommodation. Well, said Jackson Lemon, I'm after all trying now. To this she returned that she must go to her mother, and he was obliged to lead her out of the place. Lady Canterville was not immediately found, so that he had time to keep it up a little as they went. Now that I've spoken, I'm very happy. Perhaps you're happy too soon. Ah, don't say that, Lady Barb, he tenderly groaned. Of course I must think of it. Of course you must, Jackson abundantly concurred. I'll speak to your father to-morrow. I can't fancy what he'll say. How can he dislike me? But I guess he doesn't, the young man cried, in a tone which Lady Betjeman, had she heard him, would have felt connected with his general retreat upon the quaint. What Lady Betjeman's sister thought of it is not recorded, but there is perhaps a clue to her opinion in the answer she made him after a moment's silence. Really, you know, you are a foreigner. With this she turned her back, for she was already in her mother's hands. Jackson Lemon said a few words to Lady Canterville. They were chiefly about its being very hot. She gave him her vague, sweet attention, as if he were saying something ingenious, but of which she missed the point. He could see she was thinking of the ways of her daughter Agatha, whose attitude toward the contemporary young man was wanting in the perception of differences, a madness too much without method. She was evidently not occupied with Lady Barb, who was more to be depended on. This young woman never met her suitor's eyes again. She let her own rest rather ostentatiously on other objects. At last he was going away without a glance from her. Her mother had asked him to luncheon for the morrow, and he had said he would come if she would promise him he should see his lordship. I can't pay you another visit till I've had some talk with him. I don't see why not, but if I speak to him, I dare say he will be at home, she returned. It will be worth his while. At this he almost committed himself, and he left the house reflecting that as he had never proposed to a girl before, he couldn't be expected to know how women demean themselves in this emergency. He had heard, indeed, that Lady Barb had had no end of offers, and though he supposed the number probably overstated, as it always is, he had to infer that her way of appearing suddenly to have dropped him was but the usual behaviour for the occasion. End of chapter 2